Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy holidays and happy almost New Year. Uh, anybody tuning in, thank you for your uh, for your dedication. Um, uh, welcome to Agri-Food Conversations, uh, brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate here on the iSelect Fund investment team. I'm excited, I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, uh, this month's theme being cell-based meat or cultivated meat, depending on your, um, your nomenclature preference. Uh, on today's call, we're joined by Rich Kellerman, founder and CEO of Bond Pet Foods. Bond Pet Foods is using biotechnology to create pet food that's nutritionally comparable to conventional meat using some of the same fermentation processes that are employed in craft brewing. Bond produces high quality cultured fungal and animal proteins through fermentation, harvests them uh, to better meet uh, nutritional requirements of companion animals and uses the ingredients as the foundation of its complete recipes. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Bond Pet Foods market. You're potential customers for Bond Pet Foods products and services. You have built a company similar to Bond Pet Foods, or you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities Bond Pet Foods may face. Now, before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Um, and while that uh, poll is running, <clears throat> a few process comments. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information that can help Bond Pet Foods find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You can use the Q&A box, box to ask a question at any time, and we'll answer uh, as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Rich Kellerman, founder and CEO of Bond Pet Foods. Rich, feel free to take it away. Uh, thanks, David. Appreciate the intro and happy holidays, everyone. It's just two days till the new year. How the heck did that happen? Um, but my, my name is Rich Kellman. I am the co-founder of Bond Pet Foods. We're based in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. And as David mentioned, we're working with biotechnology to make pet food from meat protein like chicken, turkey, and fish without the animal. And one of the reasons that we're doing that is because meat is a beautiful thing for uh, dog and cat nutrition. It gives them all the essential amino acids that they need to thrive and it's highly digestible and bioavailable. With that, it's no surprise that the amount of meat that our pets eat, including my girl Rumples here, it, it's not trivial. If America's dogs and cats were their own country, their consumption of meat products alone would rank fifth in the world. And the demand for meat is expected to rise for both people and pets significantly over the first half of this century. So it's when it comes to being able to have the, the uh, nutritionals and the protein that's necessary for our pet's health, the stress on the system and the need to find uh, new ways of looking at uh, procuring our meat proteins becomes ever so much more important. And part of that is because while meat is a beautiful thing, it comes with a host of environmental safety and animal welfare challenges to satiate this demand. And, and really that is the paradox of meat and pet nutrition, the belief that we need to accept all the bad that comes with the good, but we don't. At Bond, we're working with fermentation technologies that have been around for more than half a century to make anything from enzymes for cheese manufacture to good bacteria for probiotic supplements or even the heme protein and the Impossible Burger, we're just reassembling that process to more efficiently and responsibly harvest high quality meat protein and use that as the foundation of a pet's recipe. Um, and so our approach is a little bit less uh, typical in the space when we're talking about cultured meat. Uh, most companies on the human food side, for example, are working with tissue engineering and cell culture to induce chicken meat cells directly to grow to a certain depth density and then create a structured finished steak, breast, other product. But our approach to meat protein is essentially using fermentation to create uh, a dry, gr dry ground protein that could ultimately be extruded into uh, kibble, freeze-dried, dehydrated, or baked, and that lends itself to fermentation. We're not trying to recapitulate the meat-eating experience to create structured meat. We're just 
most concerned with the nutritionals and bioavailability of this meat protein so that it can replace uh, conventional uh, ingredients that are currently on the market. Uh, this is a little bit of an older slide, but it shows a little bit of our progress. The key here for pet, uh, the pet food, uh, this pet food application is the nutritionals and bioavailability. We're not trying to recreate the savory taste of a steak, as I mentioned, or even the, to mimic uh, the taste of chicken because a dog and cat doesn't really care as long as it tastes good. Um, so nutrition is job one. Thus far, we've uh, screened more than three dozen chicken meat proteins to produce in our host of choice, which is currently a Saccharomyces baker's yeast. Uh, now we're north of 20 skeletal and breast muscle proteins that we've demonstrated that we can produce in uh, the, sac the Saccharomyces host that we're working with. And we are currently working on characterization of these proteins to see which ones we can co-express, for example, to optimize the nutritionals and uh, the quality of that finished product. Uh, this is an older slide as well, but this is from our chicken meat prototype that we produced in August of last year. But it shows you from a wild type yeast how we're able to, through this process, boost many of the essential amino acids that are characteristic of, of the whole cell product to get them to a level that's nature identical to chicken meat protein, or in some instances, superior to what you could get uh, off the shelf today. And aside from nutritionals, what we're really excited about is um, with precision fermentation and this approach, we have a line of sight to where over time we could not only create uh, an alternative chicken meat protein to what you can uh, get off market today, but do it in a way that is price competitive with uh, options like chicken breast trim, uh, chicken meal, dried bone broth, other popular options that are used from a formulary standpoint today. And that's, that's really, I think, what is super critical about um, this approach in this technology is it's not just our ability to do it, but our ability to do it in a way that can provide a viable, op viable option to the industry um, over time and at scale. The other benefit to this, and, and, and while we haven't con fully conducted a life cycle analysis because we're at a relatively early stage in our strain engineering and process development, we do know from parallel applications on the human food side, for example, of producing various uh, proteins and enzymes that we can achieve a significant comparative reduction in land water energy use uh, per pound of meat or kilogram per, per meat as well as reduce GHG emissions with that, that, uh, that, uh, that ultimate production uh, process once we're ready to market. And so that's something, um, you know, when we, we talked about the, the challenges with satiating that demand of meat for uh, people and pets, that, um, you know, will be super important to, to really capture and to demonstrate uh, and, and share with the public. Now, because there is a little bit of a long tail to commercialize this protein, we're still uh, roughly two years out um, of getting the commercial strain perfected, working through the regulatory, um, as well as getting that, that uh, you know, the cost of goods within the range that we're looking for. Because there is a little bit of a long tail to get to market, we are introducing what we refer to as bridge products that while the hero protein isn't meat derived, the protein is made through a similar process of, of microbial fermentation. So think of pure dried killed yeast, the microalgae, good bacteria for gut health. And the reason that we're starting there is so that we can begin to educate the public about the beauty and merits of proteins and products that are made through fermentation build that trust and advocacy. And then when our meat protein is ready in a couple of years time, we have an audience that we can convert. And, and this is a, a, 
a really critical part of the equation of marketing and building um, uh, an audience for this kind of proposition. It is novel and it is something that will take people uh, um, some time and um, you know, a, a breadth of information to really wrap their head around how this protein is made and how it can be just as safe and beautiful for their pet's health as what they're currently feeding their dogs and cats today. So this, uh, these bridge products allow us to, to have that mechanism to, to really start that dialogue and that discourse Although, you know, from the inbound interest that we have seen from the press and public today, we know that there is an appetite for this and a curiosity and a willing to try it uh, to help, um, you know, perhaps uh, help mitigate some of the own personal tensions that um, pet parents might have of eating meat on their own if they're vegetarian or vegan or flexitarian or trying to reduce that in their diets or if they're looking for a cleaner source of protein because there, there's a, a question or a mistrust of, you know, what, uh, you know, what, where the meats and proteins come from it currently in their diet. So we know that there's potential, but there will be a need for a tremendous amount of education and transparency as we and others in the space press ahead. Um, so that's a, a brief introduction to our work at Bond and what we're producing and why. Um, you know, I, I, I'd love to open it up for questions uh, and we could get more granular on the tech and other aspects of our commercialization strategy and approach. Um, but that's a, a little bit of a, a background on, on our way to meet and why we believe it has a great deal of potential. Awesome. Well, Rich, thank you so much for taking the time today um, and for, for giving us some insight into the really exciting and important work you guys are doing at Bond. Um, as Rich alluded to, if you do have questions, now is a great time. The best way to ask a question is to type it directly in the Q&A box, and I can answer all questions in the order that they're received. Um, but, you know, maybe one thing that I'll, <coughs> that I'll kick off um, uh, Rich, coincidentally, my, my sister's a veterinarian, and I was, I was spitballing with her the other day because I'd gotten a I got an email newsletter about a company that had raised some some money um, to do plant based dog food um, and do alternatives to dog food. And I think one of the things that always comes up is sort of the nutritional story around what's good for dogs, what's not good for dogs. I think that's something that dog owners, obviously, there's lots of different skews of dog owners who care about different things for their animal. Um, how do you guys how do you guys deal with that question? Because obviously, what you're doing is not a plant based product, but it's not a pure meat product, and so you sort of start dealing with um, an understanding of what's nutritionally good for an animal, um, which I assume your products are fine, but how do you deal with some of that initial questioning that you guys might get um, from either consumers or from, from, from B2B partners who might want to sell your products? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so dogs are omnivores. They're, they're not obligate carnivores like cats. So there is some more flexibility with formulation. You could uh, technically, um, uh, calibrate a recipe to give them the essential amino acids that they need to thrive through a plant-based diet, but it has to be really precise. Um, and uh, dogs need to be monitored uh, to make sure if they do make that switch that uh, over time, they're not experiencing um, uh, uh, different issues with, uh, with that diet. So it's, it's possible with a plant-based diet for dogs. The challenges from a formulary standpoint are that many plant-based proteins do have uh, anti-nutritional factors that are attached to them. So the bioavailability of the proteins, even if on paper, it looks like it can be adequate for a dog, uh, they're absorbed differently. So meat generally is superior to plant-based uh, proteins and options just because of how it's utilized by the animal. Uh, that's number one. Number two, while um, solutions with vegan formulations can serve a pet parent who has that lens and that sensibility and, and what they're shopping for, that audience is um, still fairly niche, but growing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, meat still for majority of pet parents are having something that um, 
uh, is, is uh, a meat-based ingredient on the label is still king for many pet parents. Um, they believe that meat, qual high quality meat connotes quality. So uh, we believe, and this is why we're, we're also uh, taking this approach, that there is a potential ceiling on the audience that's willing to embrace plant-based diets for their dogs and, right. uh, today. And us, as we carry forward, being able to show that it's nature identical to chicken, turkey, fish protein, and that it's, uh, you know, it is uh, essentially uh, of chicken origin, you know, that just the way that we're engineering this yeast um, is something that we feel we could, we could get a greater amount of traction if we invite people wholly into the development and production process so they could see exactly how it's made, uh, take away that mystery, but also show, um, you know, the, the, the sausage being made and then yeah. the, the data showing its equivocal performance. Yeah, appreciate that, Rich. Um, it, you know, one thing about the, the, the pet food market in terms of its perception sometimes reminds me of um, like, the li like the livestock management market not that they're similar in the in like how they operate but more so in like that i think most people when people most people don't on the surface recognize how like enormous of a market like the opportunity is for pet food and in the same token like the impact i think you did a really good job of describing that in the beginning just talking about how much meat is consumed by people's pets i mean it's just like huge and it and it continues continues to grow within within the consumer base for for dog owners, um, what do you what do you sense that their awareness is of the of the environmental footprint of the food products that their that their dogs consume? Because I think I think the general human consumer is beginning to understand more and more at a general populist level. Like this is the impact I have when I eat red meat that's produced in this way, and I have a good understanding that that has a larger GHG you know footprint than other things. Do you think that there's a similar level of understanding at for those for those dog owners of their of their dog's footprint are you having to create some of that awareness around around the problem here yeah i, th I think uh it's more the latter um it is a growing awareness right among pet parents uh you know that the meat that's used in their food also has significant impacts on the environment and animal welfare and a host of other uh things that they may care about but um, I, I think from, from our own research and qualitative, what we, we've heard is most people haven't really thought about it in depth, but now as they start to internalize their choices and they're looking through a different lens when they're shopping at the supermarket themselves, it's starting to trickle down. And you can see that really um, anybody who's tuning in in the pet food space knows that um, you know, the fastest growing brands and uh, products in the space really lean in on, um, in a conventional sense, different values and benefits of being able to be produced more sustainably or getting certified humane meats, for example, is right. part of the, the recipe and the formulation. Those are levers that uh, many pet food manufacturers are using and exploring as part of their product proposition because a growing audience is starting to care. Yeah, it does seem. I mean, it does seem like the 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 big middle piece of that market is most sensitive to probably nutrition and price. I would imagine, and that and that you guys, in addition to driving the story around impact, will be looking to compete on nutrition and price with with all the others who are out there as well. Yeah, and and that's as I said, you know, there there are other ways to produce meat protein through technology. And we're fans of other companies that are working um, on, on approaches that you know, are more pure in the sense of producing meat protein. They're not using an intermediary host to produce it. But from a scalability standpoint, we believe that fermentation makes a lot more sense, especially since we are, I don't know if I mentioned this, but we're using the whole cell. So we don't have to necessarily purify uh, the protein at the end of the process, we can use the yeast itself that allows us to produce the, the ingredient as well as the, the chicken meat protein in first instance that we're making. And that helps with the unit economics so that when 
we are uh, at intermediary scale, it is at a price per kilogram that is uh, within the range of what is available in the market. So we can have a higher inclusion rate in recipes. So it makes a more material contribution to the nutritionals and also um, be able to really displace more meat from the supply chain by making it more broadly available. Got it. Awesome. Well, Rich, uh, before we before we wrap things up here today, um, what can the audience do to help you out? Yeah, you know we're we're uh, we've been running fast for the last few years. We we uh, you know right now we're brewing chicken meat protein in our central Boulder lab. If anybody wants to come visit us in Boulder, you know we'll roll out the red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll share that. So, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're making some big strides in our tech development. We did, as I mentioned, start to introduce those uh, bridge products. I guess uh, if anybody's interested uh, for those bridge products in uh, trying them, you could go to our website and bring them into your cupboards and, um, you know, give your dogs a taste. We'd love to hear your feedback on that. Um, also, we are looking for distributors for those uh, bridge products or outlets that uh, might make sense. So if, if anybody uh, works in retail or the pet industry and would like to learn more on that, uh, definitely reach out. Um, and then more ambitiously for our meat proteins that we're developing, we are always looking for partners uh, uh, that could help accelerate various aspects of that development and or be interested in uh, some of the offtake of those future materials. So if uh, anybody um, is interested in that, reach out my, my contact information. I'll put it up. I'll just go back to the beginning here is uh, right there. So uh, my phone number, my email, just reach out anytime. Uh, I will be happy to chat. Awesome. Well, seeing that there's no further questions from the audience, Rich, I'd like to thank you for joining us today uh, on the mid mid Christmas, New Year's Eve. Uh, we appreciate very much appreciate your time, and we also really appreciate the audience's time. Thank you all who uh, who tuned in uh, today. I know um, there's a lot of well, either a lot or not a lot of stuff going on this week, depending on on who you are. Um, uh, for anybody who's new uh, to Agri-Food Conversations, we host these conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. And if you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do so. Uh, replay will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours, and new viewers can register for Agri-Food Conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, uh, please, please join us in January, where we highlight companies working on decarbonization in agriculture. I'm really excited to see the companies that show up for, uh, for next month. Otherwise, um, thank you again for your time and Happy New Year, everyone. Well, cool. thanks, David. Happy New Year.